Now on your jumbo, you will fly IFR conditions so you don't have to worry about the safety of the aircraft. Now I know you've all flown with companies before, but I think just before we actually get out onto the aircraft and fly it ourselves, I'll just very basically run through how to fly the jumbo, because I'd hate one of you to tell me you didn't know how to do this when we got on the end of the drag. Now I appreciate there are ladies in the room who are obviously pilots from another company, and I'm sure they'll understand the terminology that I'm using which means there's no need to laugh in the wrong positions, actually. <laughs> uh, basically, there is only one, there's only one known method of flying, and that is the quadrant method. We do not use joysticks for flying. What you do with your joystick is entirely up to you. Um, the only people who have joysticks are fighter pilots, because there's no room in the cockpit on a fighter. I'm not very tall. I'm about six foot two. But if I was to eject... Cheeky, but if you did eject um, from a lightning, which is still a second-line fighter in this country, when I bang out, it trims my legs off just above the knees under the dashboard. It stings when you do it. Um, you know, it's not as painful as staying with it, but it can make your eyes water when you do it. Um, and if you see a pilot about three foot six high, it could well be an ex-lightning man. Um, the other problem with the lightning is, even with the seat fully down in its down position, wearing a full bone dome, when they shut the lid and weld it, because they don't want you to get out anyway, um, I have to tilt my head on one side so they can shut the lid. Now, the world takes on a whole new look if you look at it like that and then run at it at 600 miles an hour. Uh, but you'll get used to that. Don't worry about that. Because it's so restricted, they have a single stick which is between their legs. Quadrant flying, to dive, you push the stick forward. To go right, you push that way. Left, you push that way. To climb, you pull it back till it hurts, OK? That's the quadrant <laughs> method of flying. Now, there's only one aeroplane which is different to that, and that is helicopters. Now, a helicopter has a single stick again. The rule is you can do what you like with it, but you mustn't hold it steady. You just move it. You keep it moving <laughs> all the time. You put on phenomenal amounts of power, and it defies all known law and lifts off. It should, of course, screw itself into the ground, obviously. <laughs> But they do lift off, and once you've got it into the air, you just go crazy with the thing until you get it to a sensible height, and then you hold the stick in one position and you watch what the helicopter does. Because if you wanted to do that again, that is where you put the stick, right? Uh, you know, it is a little bit hit and miss on a chopper. Even the people that build them don't have a lot of faith, and they normally put... Uh, wheels, skis, and floats on them so that you've got a fighting chance when you come down. <laughs> now, on your jumbo, you don't have this problem. You've got a massive control column. There's two, in fact. I've got one in case yours comes off in your hands. But <laughs> it's a huge thing with an Allegro steering wheel on the top with the top and bottom cut off. So you've just got the horns at the side. But the rules are the same. Shove it, pull it, turn it left and right. Power-assisted, easier than driving a tram. In the centre of your column, co-pilot, is a small steering wheel about that round. It's called nose wheel steering. It does just that. It turns the two nose wheels below the ground, and we drive it just like a car. Now, you can drive it like that in the air, if you wish. Um, it doesn't do a lot. It just turns the wheels at the front. Um, but if you feel like having a go at it, by all means, do so. And the same applies to the brakes. These are far more effective on the ground um, than they are in the air. Um, if we come up fast behind a light aircraft, by all means put the brakes on. Um, it won't slow us up, but it'll stop the wheels going round in the wings. Um, and it gives you that feeling of being part of a team. Okay? Um, the only brake you should take any notice of is a handbrake. It's a ratchet-type brake between the two pilots. It's your responsibility, co-pilot. If it comes up here, it needs adjusting. <laughs> It should come up about two notches. The rule is we mustn't land with the handbrake on. If you uh, land with the handbrake full on, the wheels don't go round, obviously, and you get this tremendous stench of burning rubber. Um, and it's followed by 18 bangs, and we're on the rim. <laughs> now, that means a lot of paperwork, obviously. Um, you know, somebody's got to fill all this lot in when we finish. And it's the first thing that the accident investigation teams look for. They go into the crash and they see the handbrake full on. Now, I'm not the sort of skipper that would drop out. I mean, I'll stick with you all the way, but you're putting me in a bad spot. You know, I don't really know what to say to this fella. Um, I could say I didn't want anybody to steal the wreckage or something like that. But it, it's, um, it's difficult to explain why we've landed with the brakes on. So if you could knock the handbrake off before we land, 
we're going to get on like a house on fire. <laughs> now you know how to fly it. We can go out to the aircraft and have a look at the aircraft. It's parked outside. It's a standard jumbo. It weighs 350 tonne when it's sat outside on the path. It's got 35,000, sorry, 32,000 gallon of fuel on board, which we stack in the wings. I'm not teaching you to suck eggs, but a normal tanker which delivers fuel to a garage carries about 5,000 gallon. So we've got between six and seven of those on our backs when we set off. We burn that juice at around 3,000 gallons an hour. So it's comforting to know that we've got about 11 hours flying on our back when we start. It's only a seven and a half hour trip to New York, so it's comforting to know that we've got nearly enough fuel to get halfway back. <laughs> um, the aircraft should have 18 wheels. If it hasn't, we'll have a word with the crew that brought it in. Uh, but normally there are 18 wheels. There should be eight under that wing, eight under this wing, and two under the front. Now, when you're sat in the aircraft, you're 32 feet above the ground. I only mention that in case you get out for walkies while we're on the ground. It doesn't matter if the passengers fall out the back, but it looks bad if the crew fall out the front of this thing, and the passengers will lose all sense of confidence if they see people in big hats falling out the front of the aeroplane. We walk out to the aircraft. My first decision as the captain is to see if it's raining. Because if it's raining, you are doing the outside checks on the aircraft, and I'm doing the inside checks. Uh, if it's a nice night, I'll walk around the outside, and you can sweat it out for 20 minutes before we set off. We get the passengers on board. We can carry up to 500 on the jumbos at the moment, um, which is just half the size of the biggest passenger carrier in the world, which is a Galaxy, a C5A American Transport, which has carried 1,100 passengers. They were Vietnamese, but it still counts. Uh, you know, I know they're only little, but you've still got to get them on somewhere. Um, so we've only got half the maximum number. For the rest of the talk, we please hear, which won't go very much longer. This is the runway. The top table is the runway. My apologies, sir, but the wind is blowing from your end. <laughs> It is important because you have to take off into wind and you have to land into wind. Well, you don't have to, but your aircraft takes up the attitude of a breeze block if you don't. And everybody else does it this way, so that's how we're going to do it. Um, so we start from that end of the runway, take off, and we land through that wall and come on. The aircraft, of course, is parked over here on a stand, which is where the, where the aircraft is parked and where the passengers will get on board. I'll make sure the passengers are on. I'll kickstart the engines, get them running for you. And you will taxi the aircraft from the stand and put it on the end of the runway. As we pull away from the stand, you, your little eyes, light up as you turn your little steering wheel, full power on. If the aircraft goes, dong, 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 you have left the steps down at the back. <laughs> now, that is one of your checks. Um, you do brakes and steps. I'll do engines and her steps. That's the sort of system that we're working on. We have another run at it. You taxi out and you line up on the end of the runway. Now, I would appreciate it if you would put the nose wheels in the direction that we want to go. If you leave them off at 90 degrees and don't tell me, I'm bound to find out sooner or later. And it means that on takeoff, instead of going down the runway, we should go through the hangar and come back on. Now, you can tell the passengers anything over the intercom. They're so blind drunk at this stage, they wouldn't understand what you were talking about anyway. But they're bound to notice if we go through a hangar on takeoff. So if you could line it up, I would appreciate it. Once we're lined up, I put on my white kid leather gloves with an L and an R on the back. <laughs> this is just sort of an aid memoir. <laughs> I don't need this information, but I don't want to ask stupid questions if it goes wrong, that's all. And we're ready to roll. Now, when you buy a jumbo for £25 million, you get a handbook with it, same as when you buy a new Mini. And it says on page six that this aircraft will get airborne at 180 miles an hour. And the editor's decision is final on that. <laughs> so all we've got to do is 180 miles an hour down two mile of concrete, and it'll go up because it says so in the book. Now... The ground controllers will give us clearance for takeoff, which means there's no horses or Midland Reds on the runway, that sort of thing. If you're at Tenerife, you ask him again. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I don't mind if you get out on the wing and have a look. You know, uh, when you're pretty convinced that we're the only jumbo on this runway, then we'll have a crack at this. And during the takeoff run, one of us ought to look out of the window, otherwise the aircraft tends to run off the edge and it breaks all the lamps down one side of the runway. 
And of course, anybody landing in the dark behind us could use all the lights they can get their hands on. So I'll look out of the window, make sure we stay down the middle. Unfortunately, I can't read the speed whilst looking through the glass. So you will call the speeds to me as we increase. When we get to 170 miles an hour, you scream, rotate. I panic because I've never heard that before. <laughs> and then I remember on page five in this handbook, it says at 10 under takeoff, you scream, rotate. Now, this is why I'm doing it and not you. At rotate speed, I very gently ease the stick back, very gently. The idea is to lift the nose wheel off the floor and balance 350 tonne on our main 16 wheels so that we get a bit of draft underneath, otherwise it's not going to go up. For obvious reasons, when I'm carrying out this balancing act, we chain the passengers in. Um, you don't want people tearing up and down inside the aeroplane. So we just use normally we we'll chain the passengers in for takeoff and for landing. They expect it now, so that's what we will do. If I overcook it, pull the sticks too hard, the tail will hit the floor, <laughs> thus ripping the toilets out the back. <laughs> Now, with 500 people on board for seven and a half hours, we could be knee-deep by the time we get there. <laughs> which is why, if you look on a modern airliner, you'll see at the back what is called a skid. It's a bar which hangs below the aircraft with a hydraulic ram against it, and that will touch the ground before the tail. In the cockpit, there are lots of red warning lights which flash, and a klaxon which sounds to indicate that we have overcooked. And we will switch those off. <laughs> um, there's nothing more disconcerting when you're panicking to have red lights and the klaxons going, obviously. Um, so if I do overcook it, we use a manual system whereby if I do overcook, you can hear the tearing metal noise. It's very distinct. You couldn't miss it. Um, and it's followed instantly by the steward banging his handbag on the door behind us. Um, and at that point, we level the aircraft and hold her in a balanced configuration. At 180 miles an hour, you scream 180 I haul the stick back hard, and she climbs off at about 2,000 feet a minute. If it doesn't go up, well, you've picked a loser with this one. Um, can't take a joke, shouldn't have joined, that sort of thing. Um, but the correct terminology, if it doesn't lift, is that we are bought on the runway. And any other bodily function that takes you at the same time, really. Um, Because it's a bit embarrassing when it all goes wrong at 180. Yeah. But the idea with an abort is power off, brakes on, we come to rest on the runway, tap the gauge, get it working, go back and have another go at it. <laughs> if we abort with a serious fault, say with an engine fire, I've had a word with the fire service and they're having grave difficulties in getting ladders and hose pipes up to 12,000 feet. <laughs> so we've come to a compromise that if we keep the fire on the ground, they'll come and put it out, right? <laughs> um, so this is the drill if we are bought with an engine fire. Now, I must stress, pilots, that this is for your ears only and must not, under any circumstances, be divulged to a passenger. If we are bought with an engine fire, we come to rest on the runway and we evacuate the aircraft. You have 90 seconds to get 500 people off. Good game, good game. <laughs> you go down the back, open all the doors, and you shout, Get off! <laughs> and they all look out 32 feet onto the concrete and sit down. Obviously, it's safer to stay on it. So now we inflate chutes out of the side, like a huge child slide with a canopy over the top, and you ask people politely to step into the end of it, which they do, whistle down 32 feet onto the concrete, an ambulance has moved them back from around the skirt of the aircraft, and that way we can get everybody off. The crew will be the last to leave the aircraft. I, as the captain, will be the last of the crew to leave. If I pass you on the way out, you are to assume the rank of captain. Is that all right? <laughs> I just thought we'd clear that up, that's all. Um, you know, we don't want any questions asked at this stage. Now, normally they go up because says so in the book, and once you're in the air, you can sit on your butt for seven and a half hours and let it fly itself across the Atlantic. It uses an inertial navigation system, exactly the same as the moonshot. The satellite uh, tracking system is exactly the same, programmed to a distant destination, but they, the system is exactly the same. So we can go down the back and have a drink. There's an upstairs cocktail bar in the jumbo. If you see me in the bar, walk away. Passengers don't like to see all the pilots drinking together, obviously. Um, so if I'm in the bar, you go down the back and talk to the passengers. When I'm loaded, you can come up, have a skinful, and then, and then I'll go down, down the back and have a talk to the, to the passengers. 
there's no problem. You've got seven and a half hours to sober up, so there's no real sweat on at all. These are company rules, not mine, okay? I must stress, we must not be seen together in the bar or in the toilets, okay? These are just, um, <laughs> as I say, these are company rules, and you should know them if you're joining the company. All we have to do now is land this heap and we can quit. Takeoff is brute force over ignorance. It has to go up. But landing bites if you get it wrong. You remember, you have to land right at that end. If you land right at the end of the table, your wheels will rip the tops off the Midland Red buses on the Coventry Road, which is not approved. If you land past here, you'll land okay, but by the time your brakes have activated, you're on the golf course at that end. That is a municipal golf course. You're not allowed on unless you've booked. <laughs> I must stress that I don't play golf, in fact, at all. I'm just, the only time I've ever hit two balls straight together was when I trod on a garden rake. <laughs> the, the only place you can land... I wish I'd never said that now, actually. <laughs> Where were we? Yes, trying to land. We're trying to land. You must land here, which is the hit point, touchdown point, crash point, call it whatever you will. Two definitions at this stage. All landings are controlled crashes. And the definition of a good pilot is a man with the same number of takeoffs as landing. So, now, to assist you to hit that point, they have installed what are called vases. More about that in a second. All you need to know to land is three degrees. It's not a pop group. It's the angle you're supposed to come in at. And at three degrees, you drop 300 foot per mile. Highly mathematical this. So if you're five miles out, it should be at 1,500 feet. Four miles, 1,200, you've got it all the way home. Now, there are some people who don't like landing at three degrees. These are people, for instance, that land on an aircraft carrier. Now, I think it's fair to say that anybody that lands on an aircraft carrier is mentally unstable. <laughs> You know, if they had any sense, they would land at the nearest available airfield and let the boat come in. That would seem logical. <laughs> but they insist on going ahead with this. So you come up high and fast behind the carrier, stick the nose down as if to impale your aircraft on the rear of its deck, never at the front, because if you miss, it'll run over you. <laughs> so you do it at the back, and just before the nose sticks in, you haul the stick back hard... The nose comes up, the tail goes down and smashes into the carrier deck, which is fortunate because they've welded a crochet hook to your aircraft and that wraps around piano wire, which is stretched across the deck, and you come to rest from 150 miles an hour to a dead stop in one second. <laughs> Normally with your face, press up against the back. <laughs> you, you get out on the wing, turn your bone down around the right way, <laughs> And they all clap, because most of them have gone down the funnels, off the side, and they... Now, if you do that with passengers on board, they will all get off about two foot six high with baggy trousers. Because you cannot take that rate of descent. There are parts of your body which are not designed to pull 8G. The people that suffer from that complaint will bear me out. <laughs> so you mustn't come in high and slam it. Likewise, you mustn't come in low, clip a couple of sheep over the next head, because it's messy and people finish up in the racks. So you come in at three degrees. And to help you do that, now you have to listen to this bit or you get it all wrong, they have installed VASIS, V-A-S-I, Visual Approach Slope Indicator, VASI. It's an oval teen tin with a plate welded into it at three degrees. It has a light which shines over the plate white, below the plate red. They put one set on either side of the runway, early of touchdown, so you want to go over the top of those so you should see white lights, and they put one set late of touchdown on either side of the runway, and you want to crash before you reach them so you should see red lights on the second bank. So when you fly in, you should see white, red, if you see white, white, you're too high, which isn't dangerous. You're going over the top, but the passengers won't get off. <laughs> if you see red, red, you're too low. You're landing far too early, and you must climb quickly, if you're with me. There's only one condition which is worse than that, and that is if you see green, because now the light is filtering through the grass, and you are extremely low. No, sorry, sorry, no, 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 no. 
No, no, it doesn't. I got carried away there, I'm sorry. It only goes red or white. And after a couple of crashes, you learn to slam it down between the vases. Now that, ladies and gentlemen, is how 99.9% .9 of all aeroplanes land, by visually looking at those lights. What happens when it's foggy? Can't see the lights. Now you use an instrument landing system to get you down. It has two needles in the cockpit. One points left or right when you come in, and you turn the aircraft left or right till it hangs straight. The other needle will point high or low to indicate you're high or low on the approach, and you push and pull until she stays horizontal, and the two needles cross in the middle, a bit like Space Invaders, really. I would fly the needles. You will call the heights to me as we plummet towards the ground. Now, we're in thick fog, doing about 160 miles an hour. The wipers are going well, but you can't see anything at all. And you will call the heights to me calmly and clearly as we dive down towards the ground and I keep the needles crossed. When we approach 30 feet, you calmly and clearly call 30 feet! And we look up. And there, in front of us, are the lights. If you can't see the lights at 30 feet, full power on, we climb straight ahead, go round and do it again, and we have just overshot. We go around the second time, if we don't see it the second time, forget it, we'll go to Manchester where there's no fog, and we have just diverted. It's as easy as that. There is only one other method to be brought down, and that is to be talked down by a controller like what I am. And I will talk you down by using a high-powered short-range radar, by getting you onto the beam, and directing you to turn left or right. Now, obviously, I only stutter when I'm under stress, but you can. You can talk an aircraft down by going left and right. You now know more about it than I do. And I'll leave you with one very last thing on Concord. It's going to take a minute. The next time you cross on a 707 or a DC-8, halfway across the Atlantic at 40,000, put one arm out the window, and two things will happen. A, everybody will go with you. <laughs> but B, the temperature outside, minus 40 centigrade. Next time you cross on Concord at 60,000, halfway across, put your arm out the window again. Rule A still applies, but they'll go twice as fast this time. But B, the temperature outside, minus 100 centigrade. If you could now turn your hand and touch the outside skin of the aircraft, you would find that the skin temperature is plus 100 centigrade due to friction. Now you can't have a piece of metal at plus 100 in an outside air of minus 100 without something happening and on a straight and level flight on a transatlantic voyage, Concorde grows in length one foot. The whole aircraft expands by one foot. If you could take the carpet up in the aisle, it's a very narrow aisle in Concorde, you would see that the floor is in plates and you can actually see them move. If you can see daylight, you should tell somebody. <laughs> But they do move, and hopefully when we get to the other end, it will shrink. Because if it doesn't, we're going to have the longest Concorde in the world after three years. And there are just two instruments on Concorde you should know about. One is inside the passenger compartments in the top left-hand corner, and it clicks up to Mach 2, twice the speed of sound, and everybody goes, very good, very good indeed. Because that's what they've paid £987 for. In fact, it's just wound on by a stewardess. <laughs> Why not? It does go up to Mach 8, actually, but they don't want to show off at the moment. And the other one is inside the passenger, in, sorry, in the cockpit, and it measures the skin temperature outside. Because if that gets above 125 centigrade, you have got trouble with a capital T. Everything goes wrong, the putty melts in the windows, all sorts of problems. <laughs> and you must cool it. Now, you can't lean out the window and waft it with your cap. <laughs> The only way you can cool it down is to reduce speed. And if you see the pilots, you'd see them open up the tanks to 1,500. As soon as the temps go to 120, power back to 1,400 while the whole skin cools down. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. You now know a lot more about it than I do. Can I leave you with one very last thing which I never understood about aeroplanes? And that is why they put frosted glass in the toilet. <laughs> Who the hell's going to look in at 60,000 feet? I don't know.